welcome to our summer and is summer <laughs> town-wide service here in the Volunteer Park stand. Uh, welcome to those of you in the stand and those of you who are at pitch level as well. Hey. Hey. <laughs> it's great to see you all. We'd like to go through the churches that have made this their service today, so can you make yourselves known by a wee wave when I mention you? The Baptist Church. Yay! Hey. Hey. Van Foot. Hey. Cavers and Kirtan. Hey. The Congregational Community Church. No? Elin. Yeah! 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 Rubber's Law. Yeah! St. Cuthbert's. Yeah! St. Mary's and Old Parish. Yeah! Tibet and Robertson. Yeah! Trinity. Yeah! The Salvation Army. Yeah! <laughs> Tibet Head. And Wilton. Yeah! I hope that if there's anybody that we've missed out, do apologise. We uh, particularly invited the Presbytery Clerk of the new Presbytery of Lothian and Borders to be with us today. So welcome to Reverend Norman Smith, if you could just wave. Thank you, that's Norman. You can buttonhole him at the end. Everyone is welcome here today, whether you're a Hoyk person, or a Hoyk and district person, or a visitor to the town. People from various churches will be taking part this morning and many others are helping in all kinds of ways. Too many to mention, but we'd like to say a special thank you to James Mabry and Graham Wilson who are looking after the sound and the video equipment for us. And Graham tells me that this may be live streamed provided it all works well. <laughs> We're grateful to the Saxon Band for leading our praise and to Lindeen and Hoyt Youth Rugby Club for allowing us to use the stand today. Any children, any children here today can go out just before the sermon. Kirsty and helpers from the Baptist Church will look after them in the club room. That's in that direction. There's an opportunity to make an offering uh, after the service, although some of you may already have done so. Those gifts, where they're not earmarked for any specific congregation, are going to the Hoyk Food Bank run by the Salvation Army. And we commend this to you as it is much needed these days. Tea, coffee and juice will be served in the club room behind the stand after the service. The stewards will show you how to get there. Please take care on the steps, they are a bit precarious. Do join us if you're able for a time of worship, fellowship together. It's wonderful to see so many of God's people gathered together in one place. A great deal of prayer has gone into the preparation for this event. And we pray that our worship will please God. And we rely on the promise in God Matthew's Gospel that where two or three, or two or three hundred perhaps, <laughs> have met together in my name, I am there among them. May we know the Lord's deep blessing in our gathering today. There are notices inside the back cover of your order of service and I would just like to mention the Borderlands Men's Christians Conference on the 23rd of September and commend that to you as well. I'm handing over now to Caroline, Captain Caroline Brophy Parkin to lead our praise. Good morning everybody. Good morning. You're all looking very well behaved. <laughs> and you know what? That worries me. <laughs> Last night I was at Heart of Hoyk and there was a group of us watching the Andre Rue concert and it was amazing to see how the audience congregation joined in and how they went for it. And you know what? There were a number of hymns being sung and there was a oh, happy day uh, they sang the song from sister act i will follow him and they were all really going for it they were got their arms in the air and i turned to my husband and i said do you think they realize they're singing about jesus <laughs> <laughs> they're not i will follow andre rue no. <laughs> they're singing i will follow him meaning jesus well do you know what we know that don't we 
we can say that we know who we are singing for this morning and if they can enter into that singing so wholeheartedly sometimes I call it whole body worship you know we get in there and we really express what we feel to God surely that we as followers of Jesus can do the same I read in Psalm 92 this morning it is good to proclaim your unfailing love in the morning your faithfulness in the evening you thrill me Lord with all you have done for me I sing for joy because what of what you have done we have an opportunity to sing for joy to tell of his unfailing love and his faithfulness to us as we come together for worship this morning i'm not sure how safe it is to stand but i will in yeah i was just saying fine he will have done the risk assessments <laughs> so i'm going to invite you to stand as we sing our first hymn together Great is thy faithfulness, O oh God, my Father. If you don't feel safe standing, or standing is difficult for you, then remain seated. Remain for the band. Yeah. With an introduction.
then the invalid jump to come and play. say together the Lord's Prayer and at the end of our prayers of approaching confession and as there are some minor variations indeed any visitors might wish to say so in their own language we will say it slowly and with reverence to accommodate these small variations as we say together whichever version is most familiar to us let us approach in God in prayer let us pray Almighty God, our Creator and our loving Father, it is a joy to come to worship you this morning. It is a joy to belong to your church family, to that great family which worships you today in all corners of the globe. It is a joy to belong to this united gathering here in Hoyt this morning. It is a joy to be united together here in your presence. And it is a joy to thank and praise you for the gift of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, the King and Head of the Church. Great God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, we thank and praise you for all that you are and for the wonder of our lives, given, redeemed and transformed by you. May this gathering today be a time and space where we find a moment in and out of time, a moment of meeting with you when the daily veil that comes at times covers our world and our lives is removed and we see your glory. Glory revealed in the beauty of the universe you have created, beauty revealed in the community with which we are part Beauty revealed to us in your precious word, and most of all, beauty revealed in the love of your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us again today to come away with you to a quiet place, to meet with you in new ways, ways that help us glimpse how things really are when we truly come into your presence, when we truly allow your light to transform us and the whole world. Holy God, there is in our world much that is wrong, much that is neglect, much that is cruel. And we confess before you that we ourselves have sinned. We have failed to do as we ought to do. We have done what we should not have done. Forgive us, merciful Father, as we now make silent confession of our faults and sins to you. Loving God, accept our prayers, we ask, and grant us renewal in our commitment to serve you as we ought. Compassionate and forgiving God, help us to look to your resurrecting love. Help us embrace forgiveness and joy as our lives 
are repurposed in your service and to your glory. And we ask this in Jesus Christ's name, who taught us these words when we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As I look around at you, I'm not sure that you are joyful enough, <laughs> or wide awake enough. Oh, so we're yes, we are. Oh. <laughs> so we're going to give you the opportunity to um, just express yourselves with joy and with actions, because our next song is really for those who are young at heart. If you're not feeling young at heart, that's okay. You can stay seated and be miserable. <laughs> who are young at heart who would like to join me for actions this is a multitasking song so as I'm telling everybody the actions if anybody would like to make their way to the front to help um, we will see anyway the song is our God is a great big God our God is a great big God our God is a great big God and he holds us in his hand He's higher than a skyscraper and he's deeper than a submarine. Go for it, Tim. He's wider than the universe and beyond my wildest dreams. And he's known me and he's loved me since before the world began. Then you freestyle. How wonderful it is to be a part of God's amazing plan. Our God is a great big God. Do you believe that this morning? So let's make sure that anybody who is walking past in the park gets to find out that we believe it. If you're able to stand, I believe that there is um, singing on the CD, so if you can't multitask, you can just do the action. <laughs> God is a great big God.
come now and bring us our scripture readings. The first reading is Psalm 133, a song of ascents of David. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 30. As a prisoner for the Lord, and I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us grace has been given as Christ appointed it. This is why it says, When he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean? Except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions. He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the full measure of the fullness of Christ. Amen. 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 We're going to sing together again. We're going to sing words that reflect those readings. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ her Lord. She is his new creation by water in the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her and for her life he died. We might be many denominations this morning and many separate or, or uh, expressions uh, of worshipping communities but ultimately we are the church of God. We are his bride who he has called and redeemed. And so we sing together and I invite you to stand if you're able to sing, to stand. <laughs> and, uh, we will be accompanied with the band here somewhere in the distance. <laughs>
Alistair is going to come and share with us the word of God. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Lovely to see you here. There's the sun back out again. Fantastic. <laughs> Come to this um, theme today, a very appropriate theme for today, of unity. That's Psalm 133 that Alison read for us. What a beautiful psalm that is. This unity. The psalm is all about what comes down from above. It's all God. It's grace and blessing coming down like the dew in Mount Hermon, like the oil coming down in Aaron's head and beard and robes. And then that last part that says he commands his blessing. There, where there is unity, there is life forevermore. What a fantastic promise. And it comes down from God. It's his blessing. The unity is his gift. In Jesus Christ, his son, we have this unity with God that he has achieved through Jesus' death on the cross and resurrection. So trusting in him, we are united by faith to Christ. But we are also wonderfully united. It's not an individualistic thing. We are united with all who belong to Christ in this mystic sweet communion these poetic words from that hymn and it's in the context of this unity that God bestows his blessing even life forevermore in the context of unity people can discover the eternal life that Jesus brings so unity is really important and we see in Jesus prayer it's not one of our readings today in John chapter 17 just before he went to the cross to pay that price, he prayed. And his prayer includes this deep prayer for unity. The deep desire of the Lord's heart that his people are united. His prayer is uncompromising in its vision and perhaps as we come to this, as we think of the way things are, quite embarrassing to us. Jesus is praying for all those who will come to believe in him, and that includes those of us, us, us believing in Jesus. He prays this, that all of them may be one, Father. In verse 23, he prays, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. For what Jesus prays here, it's so clear that this unity, this relational unity among Christians, among those who profess the name of Christ, gives for the watching world a vision of Jesus and the love God has for him and amazingly the love God has for us in him. That can be seen, Jesus says in his prayer here, and that's why he prays for this unity. In his united people, in the depth of this unity, people will see him. They will see the love God has for him and the love he has for us, amazingly. We're, standing, we're sitting here in this stand. There's a rugby match going on. You will see all this happening. You will see the quality of the teamwork in the respective teams. But we are the ones who are the spectacle for the world to look on and see and want to experience for themselves what Jesus gives. Unity. But, and we have to deal with this, we could talk about how lovely unity is and be soft and fuzzy about it all. Isn't it all wonderful? But we know there is disunity, don't we? Look at the church. Uh, how many denominations are there at the moment? How many? It's a good quiz for you. 
How many denominations are there in the World Council of Churches and not every denomination is in that? Have a guess. Tim, have a guess. 80? 352. <laughs> Maybe it's not as high as some of you thought it might be. There's a diagram at the back. There's a diagram at the back of a book I have on the history of the church in Scotland. Bodley, I think it is. You pull this diagram out, and from 1690 it shows all the various splits. It's a wonder to behold as the lines go out and they go out and they go out. They came back in again in 1829 and the Church of Scotland, so there's less than there was, but it's like a big kind of spidery diagram. We are remarkably given to factionalism and dividing up over all kinds of things which may or may not enter into the substance of the faith. They seem very important at the time when you look back at them. I do wonder, the burgers and the anti-burgers and the, all the rest of them. That's not to eat, by the way, that's to do with signing, signing oaths. They didn't want to sign oaths. Anyway, there can be disunity between uh, denominations and within denominations and between different churches, can't there? Uh, there are things we disagree about, theological issues, infant baptism, communion, predestination, spiritual gifts, the authority of scripture, what the cross achieved, what the gospel is, who can be in leadership, so on. There are moral issues such as attitudes to homosexual practice or to marriage. There are practical matters, how we should govern ourselves. Styles of worship and liturgy, length of sermons, and so on. <laughs> Hope you've not got your watch out. <laughs> Put these watches away. <coughs> there are historic huts. <coughs> these things all need to be faced up to and addressed with the truth of God's word in love with wisdom and courage, both within <laughs> congregations, within denominations. Don't we know that? In the Church of Scotland, in so many ways, and other denominations too. Wisdom and courage. Of course, despite many of these things, we can still work together across churches and denominations in reaching out to bring folk to Christ, can't we? Because our unity is quite simply in Christ. So... We can do this, we can have worship services like this, we can work together in various ways. But then, if our partnership is to go deeper, in terms of closer working together, say you want to train people for ministry, for example, to teach God's Word, or you want to engage in discipleship, uh, or, or teaching together, or if you're seeking structural unity, then we know, don't we, there needs to be deeper agreement about important matters to make that workable. There are levels of partnership that make our, that we can work together in different levels of partnership among churches with different convictions. We've got to work at that. Even organising this service can be quite interesting in terms of the kind of things people say to me from different directions, which I'm not going to repeat, <laughs> about this and that, we don't like this and that. There can be disunity within congregations. We can disagree over important things like the teaching about a particular aspect of the Christian faith if someone's got that wrong. The biblical content of sermons, if it's not there, for example. The truth and helpfulness of the hymns we sing. Key decisions and policies that are made in our life. These are all important things that, that we can disagree about, can't we? Uh, but there are also other things, and where can we start, really? Um, there's huge time and energy goes into things like whether we should use a particular instrument in worship or any instruments in worship. Why did he choose that version of that hymn? Uh, the speed of that hymn just wasn't right. Um, differing views about how things should be done in the, even in the course of a worship service. People get very head up, don't we? There are about all these kind of things. And there are clashes of personality, there are misunderstandings. There's a constructive criticism offered that is taken as anything but constructive criticism. <laughs> you know the kind of thing. 
They're not often not united. This is coming, going with you, but but often not united when you scratch just beneath the surface. Unity is very important. So a reading from Ephesians 4 speaks powerfully into this theme, this matter of unity. Paul begins with an exhortation. We've got the, the passage in the screen before it printed in front of us so we can follow on. Paul begins with an exhortation to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. And that really sums up everything that he's saying here. We have to be all that Christ has called us to be, to live that out in all the dimensions of it, what it entails in all its fullness. And then he goes on, and it's really striking how he dives in to characteristics of us, relational matters right away. This isn't about activity, it's about being together. And my sense is that as I speak here this morning, it's this area of our relationships with our fellow Christians in congregations and between them that needs to be the focus of what I'm saying. The theological, moral and practical issues are hugely important, but for today the focus will be on these relationship matters. Paul mentions five qualities. We have to be completely humble. Uh, humility wasn't a desirable characteristic back in the culture of the day. The Greeks didn't see that as desirable. It was a sign of inferiority. Why would you be humble? But it's a virtue for Jesus and it's a virtue for us and it's a lovely thing, isn't it? Humility. When you come across a truly humble person, Wouldn't we want to be like that? Wouldn't we want to be like Jesus? I am lowly of heart, he says. Someone said, um, you might be too proud to imitate a humble person, but perhaps you might be happy to imitate a humble God. And that's Jesus. Yes, we'll imitate that. I think in our culture, would you agree that the Greek view is creeping back in? That to be humble is a bad thing? We assert ourselves. And we take our stand that I am who I am. Yes, of course. But humility is a virtue for Jesus and for us. We're also to be gentle or meek. This isn't weakness. This is strength under control. Meek person, Jesus said, I am meek. I am lowly of heart. We're to be patient or long-suffering. Long-suffering. This is primarily slowness. Slowness in retaliating or avenging wrong when hurt by others. It's putting up with difficult people who rub us up the wrong way, who hurt us. Long suffering. Footballers have to learn that on pain of being sent off, and so do we in the church. It's easy, isn't it, under aggravation, um, to, as our hackles rise and you can feel it. To lash out with our tongue, to stomp off, to inwardly see. Is it true? Or is it just me? I don't tend to stomp off. I sometimes do the others. I'm sure you can experience that too. We have to be long suffering. Do you get defensive? Do I get defensive when people challenge us or say something the least bit critical? How patient, how long-suffering are we? Following on from that, we are to bear with each other. And I, I don't really watch the program Miranda, but um, there's a character in it that keeps on saying, bear with, bear with. What's her name? Doesn't matter. <laughs> bear with. Uh, staying with others. With them for the long haul. Keeping there, not giving up on them. Sticking in. I'm so glad God is like that with me and with, with us. And we are to be like that with each other. And this is all in love. Um, love holds and binds together all these other qualities in perfect unity. And leads to them all. And Jesus is of course love incarnate, love divine. Humble, gentle, patient, bearing with each other. 
in life. And this unity, Paul says, it, it comes from who God is in verses 4 to 6. There are seven ones in these verses. You just look at them there. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of, of all. There only is one God and Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and our unity comes from Him. Unity and diversity, of course, comes to that in a minute. Mm. To live a life where they were calling. So we disagree about things, but it's how we disagree about them that matters in our attitudes and relationships to each other. Is this something that speaks into your experience? Uh, I think it's something that speaks really very much into our church experience. And all the more important as we are so, well, as a lot of us here today, small in number, this unity becomes even more important. Therefore, Paul says, part of what we're saying here, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Verse 3. It's a strong word he uses. We have to spare no pains to maintain the unity the Holy Spirit gives. This unity Jesus has won at such cost for us. It's given by God. We can't produce it. But we are to work with all we have to maintain it. It can be costly. Humility. Putting up with others. There's a cost to pay. There's a price to pay. If we want to see renewal and revival, we can pray, we must pray. But there's a cost to pay, personally, in obedience and in relationships, for that to come. Our unity in Christ, so precious. How sad we might acquiesce in division, thinking that unity in the church is a lost cause. Do you ever feel like that? No, Jesus prays. May they be one. One in truth, one in love. Paul goes on in the second part of the passage, just briefly, to speak about diversity in this unity. He has given every single person in the church a spiritual gift. Christ has apportioned that grace so that we, uh, under the preparatory equipping ministry of the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers, will all use the gifts we are given so that the church, the body of Christ, can be built up and it's very striking that at the end of that reading that Bruce read for us, the word unity comes back again because the aim of this building up of the body of Christ is, verse 13, until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attained to all measure of the fullness of Christ. This unity we're speaking about is real. It's not, uh, kind of, it is mystical, but it's not mystical in the sense that we can see it happen if we do not engage with others. So unity in the church cannot be achieved by becoming a freelance Christian, or not going to church, or shutting ourselves away, and thus avoiding the challenges, or bad experiences we've had, that has been inflicted on us in church in the past. Painful things, but that unity will not be experienced, except in the reality of actual relationships within an actual church fellowship. Seems so dad to have to say it, but it needs to be said. We need to, need to know and love each other and be engaged with each other if there's going to be this unity. And there's a cost to that, there's a pain. When you love people and they let you down, there is pain, but it's essential. C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity, this just came to me, an excellent book, Mere Christianity, still, after all these years, he seeks to explain the basic truths of the Christian faith, to bring people to faith in Christ. That's his aim. But listen to this. For the extended quote, I think it's fantastic. C.S. Lewis says, I hope no reader will suppose that mere Christianity is here put forward as an alternative to the creeds of the existing communions. As if a person could adopt it in preference to congregationalism or Greek orthodoxy or anything else. It is more like a hall, this mere Christianity, 
out of which doors open into several rooms. Lovely picture of this. If I can bring anyone into that hall, I shall have done what I attempted. But it is in the rooms, not in the hall, that there are fires and chairs and meals. In the hall you must be asking, which door is the true one? The question should never be, do I like that kind of service? There's an Anglican C.S. Lewis. <laughs> but the question should never be, do I like that kind of service? But are these doctrines true? Is holiness here? Does my conscience move me towards this? Is my reluctance to knock at this door due to my pride or my mere taste? Or my personal dislike of this particular doorkeeper? <laughs> Great words. Commitment to a local, tangible expression of church with all its flaws and frailty is essential. I'm probably speaking to the converted here. But it is. Never find a perfect church here until we get to heaven. But we remember Jesus' prayer for unity and Paul's exhortation to maintain unity so that the church fellowship we are part of in our prayers and our giving of ourselves in our relationships together can grow in this unity until that day in heaven there will be no more denominations just one vast multitude that no one can count before the throne just the one and we get a foretaste of that at times like today don't we? In a small, beautiful way. In times of revival, when people come to faith in Christ, or to revitalization of faith in Christ, and the Holy Spirit is working in power, such can be the depth of, the, of love for Jesus and His truth that denominational differences recede into the background. Like when rain comes and there's a flood and the, the, the waters rise and the fences and hedgerows around the fields are submerged by the water so you can't see them anymore because we are lost in the depths of the flood of the love of Christ himself and caught up in him and his truth oh it's a foretaste of heaven Lord bring it here please a bicycle wheel who you might be wondering <laughs> who has left the bicycle wheel here think of the hub as Jesus and the spokes as believers where are the spokes nearer, nearest to each other <laughs> nearest the hub yes they cross over some of them are closer to each other elsewhere but it's at the hub that they're all closest together the closer we get to Jesus Christ in reality by His Spirit, holding to His Word, knowing He's in us and we're in Him, the closer we will be to each other. This Christian life is not a fantasy kind of thing. It's real. And being connected with Jesus changes everything. And indeed changes the church. make this a bit more personal. How are you in your relationship with Jesus today? How am I? How are you in your relationships with fellow Christians today? How am I in that? Is there something that is not right that needs sorted out? Is God putting his finger on something even as we're here today speaking about unity? Is he putting his finger on something that needs sorted out? Do you need to sort things out with God? Your minister or pastor or myself or one of the other church leaders, I'm sure will be happy to speak to you after if you want to speak about that. Or maybe there's something you need to sort out with someone else who's here, who's not here. If you can. David Watson was a minister and evangelist, a hero of mine, who led many missions in various parts of the world. Here's what happened at one of them. It's a wee while ago now, in the summer of 1978, 
You'll see that in the references to telephone boxes in a minute. In the summer of 1978, we led a mission for the whole of Cornwall, based mainly on Truro Cathedral. One night, I asked all those present who felt that they needed to cook right some relationship to do so before they went to bed, if possible. Talk when you get home, I urged. Make a phone call, write a letter. Outside the big west doors of the cathedral were many telephone boxes. No more mobile phones in those days. <laughs> I heard later that after the service was over, there were queues of people waiting to make a telephone call. And I understand that many relationships were put right that night. In the cathedral the next night, the sense of God's presence was almost electric. The Spirit of God was no longer grieved through long-standing bad relationships and was thus free to move in unusual power. The restoration of relationships released God's blessing. Psalm 133 say how good and pleasant it is when God's people dwell together in unity. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. When our relationship with God is right, and we agree with each other in Christ about what really matters, the Holy Spirit is able to come upon us with fresh reality and power. So unity, so important. We know that, but may be that we now even see it as more important through God's word to us this morning. May it be the unity we know, and we do know it, don't we? We, we? we have that experience in our own churches and here today in other ways. But may that unity grow. May we make every effort to maintain it. May the Lord be glorified in that increased unity and relationships put right. <coughs> Our God is a reconciling God. And may Hoyk see Jesus in those of us who profess his name. For this place we love dearly and pray for to come to know the eternal life that Jesus Christ brings. May God bless his word to our hearts. Amen. Amen. Reflecting on Alistair's words, we make a pledge to one another through the song word. Brother, sister, let me serve you. Let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant too. So we're going to sing this together, accompanied by the band. And if you're able to stand, we invite you to stand.
Please be seated and we'll join it together in prayer as Martin leads us. Let's pray together. Father God, as we've begun to respond to you in song, so now we come to respond to your word in prayer. We begin by praising you, the God who is within himself one, diversity of eternal persons, Father, Son and Spirit, and yet beyond time and into eternity, always one within yourself. We recognise it is you, the God, who has come now to make us one with yourself and one with each other. We recognise again it is our sin that broke our relationship with you and it's our sin that ruins all of our relationships with each other. And yet through the blood of Jesus shed on the cross, you reconciled us back to you, brought us back into the oneness of the Godhead and at the same time made us one with each other. You've brought down the dividing walls of hostility that stood between us and have brought us to belong not just to one father but to one family in Christ. Father, in light of all the amazing things you've done for us in Jesus, we do want to respond in light of this word on unity by praying for forgiveness. We pray you forgive us for the times in which we have not loved and valued and treasured the oneness of your people, the times we've not sought to protect it and preserve it. We pray to you, Father God, that you would give us a spirit of forgiveness in our own hearts for those who have hurt us within church families. Father, we pray we would strive now in response to your word, especially within our local churches, to live as one. We recognize this is the place where you've given us the opportunity to act in humility and patience and to bear with one another in unity as church families. So Father, we pray for that spirit to be at work among us. We pray that we would be like the Lord Jesus, considering the needs of others better than our own. Help us to adopt that attitude within our hearts. Father, we pray to you that we wouldn't abandon the truth that does make us one. We recognise with no truth there is no unity and we gladly do not share fellowship with those who don't stand on Jesus. And so, Father God, we pray our churches would never become empty clubs that just get together because we get together. But we would be close because we are close to Christ. Close because we believe profoundly in the truth of his word and the necessity of church. Father, we pray... For any who are here who've seen church as something optional, Father, how can we claim oneness with you if we don't walk in oneness with other people? Help us to see the urgency of being one together. Father, we pray then for the witness of our church families, of multiple local churches which are living out this eternal and global unity in close local community. Father, we pray that as we love one another and serve one another, lay our lives down for one another within our churches, that the image of your Son would be reflected to our communities. Even as Alistair preached, that we would give this town a picture of Christ that they must respond to, that we would demonstrate the power of the gospel by being one with each other. Father, we pray this for each of our churches. We pray that we would be those who invite our friends who are outside of Christ to come and see the family of Christ, to come and meet a group of people who live out his holiness, who display his grace through their relationships, and who speak together of his saving love. Father, we pray that in light of what we've heard this morning from Alistair through your word, that by your spirit you would apply it with power to our hearts, that as we imitate this within our local church families, you would lead men and women, boys and girls from this town to know you and to believe in you, to become united with Christ and live in union with his people. Father, help us to trust your method. The church is plan A, there is no plan B. This is the place where you display the manifold wisdom and glory of who you are in frail gatherings of frail people, proclaiming a foolish gospel and yet for those who believe, it is the power of God. Be it what we pray, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Martin. Well, our time of united worship is drawing to a close, but not our unity. May each of us go from this place, making, in the words of Paul, every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace.
we love one another, don't we? God made us family. Our final song together is We Are Marching in the Light of God. As we go from this place, we march in His light, we march in His power, we live in His love. Nothing of ourselves, it's all about Jesus. And so this is a song that um, makes you want to move, um, so feel free to do so, and I invite you to stand as we sing together. or a congregation will be coming to the community food bank that the Salvation Army uh, administer and distribute. And don't forget to join everyone in the club room 
four, a tea, coffee, juice and a blather. But we will now close by saying the grace together. It's on your programme so everybody can join in. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us.